G'day everyone, Matt Elder, Family Bricks here today, and I'm joined by Mr. Neil Marsden. How are you going, Neil? I'm um, very good, thanks, Matt. Very good. Excellent to hear. Uh, super excited to have Neil on the show today. Uh, to give you a bit of a flavor, Neil's going to talk to us about digital building, which is a lot of what he does. And the way which I initially came across Neil is I was doing some digital building to do my Triceratops, which I'll show a video around here. And when I came across that, I came across some of Neil's scripts on GitHub, I believe it was. And yeah, yeah, they were on GitHub. Yeah, so that's, and there was really good setup there. And I started to go along to the London Atfalls meet. And the first meet I went along to, I was having a chat to, I think it was the Prince of Goonville. And he mentioned, oh, if you're into digital building, then there's this guy called Neil and he does a bit. And it just tweaked to me, like, what are the chances that it was the Neil, which I'd been uh, using your files because I had on my directory, you know, the Penny Forge directory. And then we got onto Slack and it was you. And then it's like, oh, wow, we got talking and geeked out. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as, there, are, there, are, there don't seem to be that many people doing digital Lego, but, but there are a few out there, sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think the the thing which started to come out of that is you do a lot more just purely digital, and then I was using it to actually translate it to the physical, and then just how I was then incorporating technic pieces in to actually do that. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's that translation between digital and physical is is um, is quite demanding, really, and and you know I learn a lot from you, Matt, about how to think about colors and and um, you know construction because obviously if it's just digital. You can kind of do anything you want, but when you have to make it physical, there are certainly other things to think about that I hadn't particularly focused on. So it's it's been a great experience in, in learning, you know, different different ways of doing things uh, within the digital world. Yeah, yeah, and I think certainly I was starting to modify some of the scripts and do my own little bits, and then that back and forth, and just sort of filling in each other's gaps. But I think more so just the way you'd gone through and written out the. Uh, the optimization uh, <laughs> that was a, a neat little bit of code there uh, yeah I mean it's it's um I think I started writing some of these scripts because I went along to to London Affles and and people would say to me oh you know would you be able to do this or, or could you try and do that and I sort of said yeah why not um, so you know a lot of my more recent work has been um, driven by by Affles saying oh it would be great to do this or it would be great to do that um, which is which is lovely, you know. It just makes it seem um, more interesting, and 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 you know, it has a real application to to people building building Lego models. Yeah, and it's just not a matter of you sitting there writing scripts which amuse yourself, but then somebody else is able to pick up that and uh, run with so. it and yeah. do it there. Yeah. So yeah, just also mentioning the London Affolds. Uh, recently, we had a masterclass, and you did a presentation on digital building, which even I learned so much out of that. So I thought, you know, let's let's get a camera and uh, do a bit of a recording. So what you're going to see here now is the part of that presentation that Neil did, and then at the end of that, we'll go through maybe tease out some more bits and pieces and go into a bit more background and some rapid fire great thanks matt i'll um i'll just share my uh presentation um that i did and then then we can we can walk through that yep um and also uh for those watching around the video there should be a pdf version of this so you can uh neil's been kind enough to donate that and you'll be able to follow along as well so without further ado i'll hand it over to neil and he can run through and talk about all the digital lego goodness um, that's great. Thanks, Matt. So uh, as, as we've said, I'm just going to talk through um, some of my experiences of digital Lego uh, and kind of my own digital Lego journey. Um, and I'll say right at the beginning that uh, I've added links to, to everything that I plan to talk about uh, on the final page of the presentation. So um, if you if you do want to look into something in more detail, there, are, there is a links page at the end um, where you can find all the all the clicks that, that you need to, to click on. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, three things um, today. Modeling, which is how you build them. Rendering, how you make them look nice. And, and I'll, I'll touch on a little bit on how you build uh, instructions. And I'm going to focus really on um, offline tools. Um, I know there are some online tools. Um, most notably Mechabricks, but I, I'm going to focus on the offline tools here. So the ones that you download to your to your local workstation or local laptop, and and you know you can build your Lego 
on your local machine because that's tend to be tends to be what I do. I do a lot of my work just commuting on the train, um, and it's kind of important to say that all the tools I'm talking about here are, are free in some sense, and uh, some of them are really easy um, and and good fun to play with, and then some of them are more complicated um, and get a little bit more challenging. Um, but that is one of the the great things about about digital Lego. It is it is free. Um, and my basic laptop that I have on the train is about 10 years old. So you don't need a kind of supercomputer to do all the things we're looking at today. Um, as you get into rendering, um, then obviously you can need a little, little bit more power. But in terms of building, then any old laptop is probably good enough. So I'm going to start by just talking about uh, modeling um, and uh, you know, how you make digital Lego models. Uh, and I'm going to look at some of the tools that I've used um, over the last few years. Um, so I started my Lego, uh, digital Lego journey, uh, really in, in Lego Digital Designer, which is in some respects the sort of uh, the classic uh, Lego tool for building digital Lego. Um, and my first Lego models, these ones, um, were all done in uh, Lego Digital Designer, or LDD as it's often called. Uh, and if you're planning to work with uh, kids and, and schools, then uh, LDD is, is re a really nice tool. It's most Lego-like. It, it feels very Lego-ish, as you might expect. Um, but underneath, it's actually got a really complex physics engine and has a very robust licensing system. And I kind of wonder if, if Lego give us all the goodies um, that they may use uh, within their own systems. But... For, for, what, for what we get, it's a great tool, um, but it has been a little neglected by Lego over the years, and, and actually you can't really download it directly from Lego's site anymore. Um, but it's still a great tool, and, and the pros with it are it's, it's good for kids, and it's very Lego-like, um, but the disadvantages, the cons, if you like, uh, it's been a bit abandoned by Lego, uh, and the models must be kind of physically accurate. Um, so it kind of forces you to put bricks in certain spaces and certain connections when sometimes you know that you could bend it in a certain way or twist it in a certain way and it, sometimes it doesn't quite let you do that. Um, and the last thing uh, that, that LDD struggles with is really making nice images. Uh, they, it can create some basic images but it's quite hard to get a good image out of LDD. And, you know, you can sort of bend the rules in LDD. So these are a load of custom decals that, that I made um, based on the Paralympics from 2016. But this was so hard to do that I've actually forgotten how I did it. Um, and I kind of got to the point where I started thinking, well, there must be a better way of doing some of this stuff. Um, and I started to look around for other solutions. So one of the tools that's come out more recently um, and has become quite well established is uh, Stud.io. Um, it's developed by Bricklink, um, which is now obviously owned by Lego. So Lego kind of owned this too. And this is based on something called the Open LDRAW standard, which is, a, which is a library of bricks. And it's become very popular and it's a really good all round tool set. Um, it's got uh, good modeling tools, good renderer, and good instructions. Um, so for a lot of people, um, this is, this is a, a really good place to start with your digital Lego. Um, and it has access to lots of modern bricks um, and everything really works quite well together. Um, I suppose the only disadvantage with uh, Stud.io at the moment is not everything quite works. Um, so some of the flexible parts are missing um, some of the rendering can, can be a bit strange, um, but for uh, an introduction to Digital Lego, this is probably your best bet. One of the important things for, for Stud.io that I know is important for a lot of builders who do want to work with physical Lego as well is that it integrates very tightly with Bricklink. Um, so uh, you can submit your uh, model that you build directly into Bricklink and then it will um, allow you to, to buy those bricks to make that model. Um, and currently 
you know, this is one of the uh, areas where Stellio really excels in. Um, and for, for many builders, it's a really powerful feature. Um, so that's a so that's another good aspect of stud IO but it's not actually the tool that that I use to do much of my building now um, I tend to use something called uh, LDCAD um, uh, which is a kind of high-end um, Lego CAD tool computer-aided design and uh, it has support for um, all the flexible parts, um, and you can see a number of them here, um, including all the parts for power functions and, and those kind of elements. Um, you can add custom decals. Um, there's non-physically accurate part, part placement, part nudging, grid snapping, part snapping, all the things you'd expect from a high-end um, Lego CAD tool you'll find in, in LDD. And, and Sometimes I, I build models in it to see if I can find something that doesn't work, but I haven't quite found anything yet. Um, so, you know, for me, this is my tool of choice when I'm when I'm building um, Lego mocks. Um, so uh, it's it's but it, it is a bit quirky, and um, my advice is to work through the tutorials on the on the LD CAD website, which is what I did, which will give you a good introduction into all the tools um, that you can find in here. Another one that I use sometimes is MLCAD. Um, and I particularly use it if I'm doing minifigures. Um, it has a nice minifigure generator, um, which allows you just to swap your parts um, for your minifigures in and out very quickly. And you can then export your minifigure to use in, in other models and you can add custom decals, but it's a really good starting place for uh, minifigure design. It's worth maybe just touching on um, what is LDRAW, which is what all these tools are based on. Stud.io, LDCAD, MLCAD all use LDRAW. And um, as you can see in the slide, it's, a, it's an open standard for, for Lego CAD. Um, that gives you a library of all the bricks um, and it's maintained by a lot of volunteers who add new bricks into it um, and you know it is a very powerful um, back end to all these CAD tools um, and it allows you to build all these digital models um, and it's great to know that it's open source and it's and it's free to use um, so it's it's just worth saying you know it's a good job we have Eldoral because uh, it is a really important part of, of digital Lego building. Beyond kind of building your own um, digital mocks, uh, the, the one aspect of digital Lego is you can start to move into um, beginning to script your uh, model creations. And um, one of the tools out there is called Open OpenSDRAW. It's not one that I personally spent um, a lot of time looking at, but it, my, my uh, brief assessment of it says it is a very powerful tool set, um, but there is a level of complexity that you need to um, work with um, to get some of these uh, models out. But its ability to work with libraries of Lego parts and sub Lego models um, is really quite powerful and um, certainly something that I'd like to spend more time in. Um, because it does seem to have a lot of features as you move into some of those advanced elements of, of digital Lego building. A lot of the work that, that I actually do now is based on uh, using Python and, and LDRAW directly. So I write a lot of scripts um, to uh, create images that would be perhaps difficult to create otherwise. Um, and that's where I kind of enjoy digital Lego. Um, it's for me, it's about creating imagery that, you know, might be quite difficult to make if you had to do it manually or you had to build it as a, as a mock, it, it would be quite hard. So, um, you know, minifigure placement, um, according to, uh, designs or, or creating models from uh, voxel data or creating, uh, text, uh, letters all built using um, Python uh, and integrating with LDRAW and 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging experience, but you can create some lovely images um, that, you know, can look quite unusual for, for Lego designers. So that's the end of uh, kind of some of the modeling tools that I've used. Um, what I was going to talk about next is really rendering um, or, or making it look nice. Um, how do you turn your, your digital models into uh, nice visual images? With LDD, um, Lego Digital Designer, one of the uh, more accessible tools is called Blue Render, and um, it allows you to import your uh, LDD design and basically press a big button that says render and it will make a nice image for you. Um, that looks pretty good, um, certainly much better than anything you could create in, in LDD itself. And um, it just allows you to, to create some nice visuals. If you have got lots of models that you built in LDD, then uh, Blue Render is a good way of creating some nice images. You can see on the bike that sometimes uh, it looks a bit grainy, um, but uh, it's still a nice image and, um, you know, it's certainly good enough to show people some of your designs um, that you might have built in LVD. Stud.io has a very nice, uh, simple, accessible renderer that creates some really nice images. Uh, and I often use it just to do quick renders of, of models that I've built. Um, again, within Stud.io, there's kind of a big button that says render. If you just choose the defaults, you'll get a pretty nice image out of it. And um, that is one of the nice features of Stud.io. It's just very easy to turn a, what looks like a, a simple Lego model into really quite a nice image. And Stud.io also has an ability to create um, little animated sequences of your build. Um, which again is another way of, of uh, displaying some of the work that you might have created um, in Stud.io. As you, as you move into these um, more uh, demanding images, if you like, that, that they take longer to create. Um, so this little sequence here took about three hours on really quite a fast computer. Um, it wasn't it wasn't my 10 year old laptop that's for sure so that is one thing to bear in mind as you as you start to create more interesting and and uh beautiful lego images they do take a little longer to render um but uh, it's very easy to get these out of stud.io it is just a few clicks to create these type of images i should just touch on um uh, a tool called Povray, uh, Persistence of Vision Ray Tracer, um, which um, you'll still see mentioned a lot in a lot of um, Lego software. You'll see it in LD View and you'll see it in Stud.io. It's kind of the granddaddy of Lego renderers. Uh, and you know, for a while it, uh, it made some of the nicest Lego images, um, but it's quite hard to configure and it takes quite a bit of tweaking. Um, so, you know, it's been sort of superseded by the renderer in, in Stud.io, which just makes it a lot simpler just to get nice pictures out. But Povray has been around for, for many years and uh, for quite a while it, it was definitely the go-to renderer for creating Lego. Um, it still has a couple of advantages. It, it, it allows uh, fully scriptable rendering, so you can render from a command line if you're rendering a lot of images. Uh, and it also has an ability to, to auto-center um, Lego models, uh, which is actually quite hard. Um, it uses a little program called uh, L3P, uh, which can allow you to auto center and frame models. Um, so it does still have some some useful tools, um, but but these days it's it's sadly become more neglected. Um, but it still it still creates some nice imagery. Um, many people have started to use uh, Blender, which is a uh, comprehensive modeling animation and rendering system um, that allows you to, to do almost anything uh, not just with digital Lego but with with digital imagery as a whole um, and it's, it's a very powerful tool by itself um, but it also has the ability to import uh, LDRAW Lego models so you need to add a little plug-in um, but again once that's done it's very easy to get your Lego models in there 
um, but it it is quite challenging in terms of setting it up but there is a lot of power in there and you can create a lot of interesting images so this is a, a, a blender render where on the left of the kind of normal stud io uh, rendering output and on the right we've added some colored soft edge spotlights um, just to give a little more of an exciting feel to our to our image um, so these are some of the things that you can start to do in blender and, and there are there are many other tools in there um, that you can use to enhance your lego your lego images and once you've moved your lego model into into a tool like blender you can then start to move it around uh, in all sorts of different 3d software um, so i've used uh, Modu, which is uh, quite a high-end television production software to render the, the image on the left. Um, and it renders all the flexible parts and, and lighting shadows as, as you would expect, decals on the wall. Um, I've also taken models into SketchUp and used some of the rendering textures that, uh, that SketchUp can use. You can bring models into Maya. And um, I built a, a website to uh, render piles of bricks um, called Bricolo, uh, again using Modu's Lego renderer, um, which is all command line driven, so it's all um, controlled by scripts uh, rather than rather than someone sort of looking at looking at the screen and thinking that's a that's a good image to render. It's all controlled by scripts. Um, so once you've moved your your model out of out of Eldroy, you do get a lot of power to move it around all these different digital tools. And the last one that uh, that I'll touch on is uh, Lego and Unreal Engine, um, which again I've really only just started to look at, but um, it allows you to bring uh, Lego models into Unreal Engine 4, which is a very powerful tool set um, used to create a lot of modern games. Fortnite, for example, um, and, and many other modern games uh, use Unreal Engine. And once you've brought your Lego into this environment, you have access to a full physics engine, uh, photorealistic real-time lighting. Um, yeah, it's a very, very powerful tool set. And um, I think it offers a lot of opportunity to, to build some really exciting um, lego visuals um, that hopefully i'll get time to explore in the in the near future so that sort of brings my my sort of overview of some of the rendering tools um, available to you um, the last little thing i wanted to touch on was was how we make instructions uh, how you actually build the models that that you may have that you may have created digitally and really to create a set of instructions you have to have built a, a digital model um, but a number of the tools will then simplify the process of, of laying out those bricks for you as you might expect to see in some Lego instructions. For the vast majority of, of models, Stud.io creates really good basic instructions. Um, it gives you a lot of control over uh, which parts you're adding at any given stage, which parts you want to highlight. Um, and you know it's it's probably the the easiest tool to use for building for building models the only thing i'd i'd say is you know if you are making instructions and you plan to distribute them build your model using the instructions first because it's very easy to to get a step wrong in in the process and suddenly it doesn't quite fit together the way you expect it that's particularly true if you're working with with kids because they will follow it to the letter and when it doesn't work they'll all put their hands up to say it's broken um so Stud.io is a great starting point for building instructions. But again, the current problems with flexible parts mean you can't rely on Stud.io for everything just yet. I'm sure they will fix all the flexible parts, but right now there's still a few things that you can't do. So sometimes you have to fall back to uh, another old classic, which is called LPUB 3D, um, which allows you to um, include all the flexible part elements, um, and add you know extra bits that you might not see in a standard set of lego instructions and 
sometimes I run um, Lego Robot Wars sessions for uh, schools and scout groups. And I've found that sometimes you need to add a little more detail to your instructions, some notes, some big arrows, um, because, again, children want to know exactly where a piece is going or exactly which piece they're putting in. Um, so uh, LPUB 3D, very quirky, slightly frustrating to use, but it does allow you to build a full uh, instruction set, um, including all the all the elements that, that you might want to emphasize. So that's really the end of the presentation that I've got today. Um, you know, for me, there seems uh, so many more things to discover with Digital Lego, um, and there are so many different areas to explore, um, which is one of the reasons why I, I still find it fascinating. There's, there's always another avenue to, to look down with Digital Lego and another building technique or software tool that might create a, a much more interesting um, Lego image. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I put all the all the links on the on the last slide in the presentation. So if there is something particular that you want to download and look at, then feel free to download the PDF of this presentation and um, click on the links uh, to explore further. I think that's me done that. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much for that. It's when you did this presentation at the the AFOL's, you know, coronavirus we were all doing uh the meeting remotely which was an interesting experience in itself uh having a bit of an idea of the digital stuff and then when you went through and did it it's like there's so much stuff out there which you didn't have a clue about and I just found it was great the way that you're able to you know put the main pieces there in terms of whether it's ldd uh ld cad and that and sort of give a bit of comparison as to where the strengths and weaknesses are so um even going through it a second time um just picking up some more bits and pieces so that's brilliant thanks very much for that um oh you're welcome i'm 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 it's great to have an opportunity to share it with people um like you say there's there's so many tools out there and um it, it can be a lot of fun um uh, you know and and you know, I really enjoy trying to create um, interesting Lego visuals as, as many people enjoy creating interesting Lego mocks. So yeah, it's great to share it with people. Yeah, and I think certainly the, the digital aspect, when you go from the digital to the physical, you start figuring out just how expensive it is. So <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that is, that is very true. Um, yes, I mean, the, the, the cost challenges are, are uh, sometimes considerable. And um, yeah, it's 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 really important to get a handle on that, perhaps early on, um, which which can which can help guide you in in your real physical building as well. Yeah, I know there's certainly some things. I did a uh, a master woo, like a, a a full size two two foot one, and so sort of like okay, I'll do the staff in brown, and then you know built it all out, and then went to actually then go and order it, and then realized that that brown was actually a really rare part. And yeah. it was sort of like to get the numbers that I needed, it's like 110 pieces. It was like through about 15 or 16 different BrickLink sellers. And then half of them was selling you, it wasn't the old brown. It would be the, um, I can't remember. There's a, there's a red brown and it's very close if it gets faded, but um, that's digress into that. So uh, one of the things which you might just, uh, as you're talking about interesting visuals and things uh, going through it, the thing which really struck me has been your Mario and your Yoshi one, which I know comes out of your, um, the scripts and the voxels and that. And I just wanted to, if you could at a very high level, sort of describe that sort of pipeline of how you go from, um, I guess a, a model in something like Blender, which you've just done as a, a, a pure three D um, wireframe model, to converting it to your voxels and so forth. Uh, yes, uh, I can. I can walk through at a very high level. I mean, you'll you'll build your three um, D model uh, in in a tool like Blender, um, and you'll add some textures to that model, which will give it its colors as 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 you look at it in a in a 3d modeling package um so for yoshi you'll obviously have green with red elements and mario uh, red uh, textures around him with with blues and, and other colors um and there are then some tools that will allow you to convert um your 3d blender model 
uh, into uh, voxels, which are three-dimensional pixels. So they're little cubes, if you like, of, um, of your standard 3D model. Um, and once you've created this uh, voxel model uh, made up of lots of little cubes, um, you can then translate those cubes into Lego parts. Um, and that's uh, really the bit of software that I wrote. It would, it would scan every layer of the, of the voxel model and work out the color of the, of the voxel at any given point and then translate that into a Lego, um, a Lego part and its associated color. The tricky bit is then to merge all the individual one by one bricks that you have into larger pieces. Um, and that's one of the both challenging and fascinating parts of Lego is that if you built everything with just a one by one brick, it would obviously fall apart. Um, so you have to build some, uh, some code that allows you to merge those bricks together, but it's also aware of the colors of the bricks. Um, because obviously you don't get mixed colored Lego bricks. They're all the same color. Um, so that's what my software did. It, it would scan um, each layer of the voxel model and then work out the biggest part that you could fit into that space and understand the color of, of those parts. Um, and once, it, as it processed the voxel file, it would simultaneously create the equivalent LDRAW file using the parts that it had decided were, were the best fit for that model. Um, and if you look, um, uh, you know, I've got some websites that show you information about, about how I did this. What you end up with is a skin of colored bricks um, around a kind of core of single colored bricks, um, which, which works very well. Um, but yeah, that, that, was, that was really the, the process. Um, and, and as Matt touched on earlier, the, the code is freely available on GitHub. Um, and um, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a PDF document there well, as well that explains you know, the process you need to go through. But um, touch wood, most of the time, it, it generally works. Yeah, yeah, and I certainly had a look through um, that script that you had there, which was done in Python. And I mean, you you might be downplaying a little bit, but the, there's some really funky things that you've got going on there. And as you say, it's the idea of just joining two bricks together for us as people is a really simple idea. But then trying to translate that into into code and taking account of parameters, like what you say, everything has to be a brick of the same color, um, and the way then that falls out and comes together is quite difficult to implement and the solution that you've got there is you know actually quite a really good one so yeah no it is uh, i think that's why i enjoyed it as well because i having done it it's uh it doesn't seem that hard but i do remember when i was doing it it really was quite hard um, but that's that's part of the fun of it is is to um try and fix uh some of some of the the issues you encounter and, and originally i made a, a black and white one or a grayscale one which was kind of relatively easy and um it was one of the london affles who said to me well could you do it in color and i foolishly said well yeah of course uh, but that took about another three months um but uh, but yeah it was a it was a fascinating challenge yeah yeah and so just extending off that your virtual background you have um the the model there that's all digital isn't it Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a, a pile of bricks um, that are um, a hundred percent fitted together. So there's no spaces between um, any of the bricks, um, which again, and, and all the bricks are different shapes, so they're not all one by ones. Um, and again, it's it's just a fascinating challenge to to try and fit uh, multiple brick shapes. And I think that one is also plates as well brick shapes and plates together so there are no gaps um, and once you've um, once you've done that you can then start to fill spaces it's a, it's another a way of, of filling um, 
a volume um, different to the way that I built Yoshi and, and Mario. I was looking for a different way of doing it. And um, this particular train of thought um, ended up with, uh, with building Lego Letters, um, which is another uh, software tool that I wrote uh, that's also on GitHub and uh, it fits um, random sized Lego bricks into into letter shapes um, uh, which again it, it doesn't there don't seem to be many many options to do that um, but but you just get to make some nice some my, nice Lego letters that, that you can use to you know, show your work and stuff yeah, and certainly I think once you put that out and made that available, I think uh, really saw the potential in that because then for like titles for videos and things like that and being able to go, you know, I think the one which I did at the time was like Merry Christmas because it was Christmas and then chose the red green color theme. And yeah, you were then able to spit out a model really quickly of um, of those that that font in Lego bricks, which is brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's it's it's, but that's that's as I said at, at, during the presentation. There's so many things to to create and to do in in digital Lego. It's that's kind of why it's it's so fascinating um, because uh, there are uh, there's so many more things spinning around in my head that I just don't don't ever seem to quite get the chance to do. But you know they're all there, and and you know if anyone else wanted to try them, uh, it's it's. It really is a fascinating journey uh, into into creating some really interesting, both visuals and real physical models. Um, if if you wanted to do that. Yep. Do you want to talk a little bit about your Bricolo website? Uh, so uh, Bricolo was really um, I'd spent quite a bit of time um, trying to build an online Lego renderer. Um, and um, at the time, I was using Povre, um, and uh, I was doing some of those things about auto framing models and um, command line scripting, all the rendering. Uh, and I had a I had a system of of kind of uploading a uh, a Lego model, uh, an Eldraw Lego model, to my online renderer, and it would render. Um, a nice picture of my model, nicely framed. Um, but then I, but as I started to look around, I kind of discovered Mecha Bricks and thought, well, they do a lot better than me, so there's not much point in, in me doing that. But I was also working with Modu at the time um, and just playing around with the rendering in that. And I was also working on creating sort of physically possible piles of Lego. Um, which is also kind of surprisingly difficult digi digitally, um, particularly when you mix bricks and plates to know where a model, where, where a part exists um, within a construction as you build it, is quite hard for a computer to think about um, because LDRAW doesn't obviously support collision detection. Um, so you have to do quite a bit of maths to to work out where you're going to place your next brick in a pile, given that, given that the pile of Lego bricks you're working with is random. Um, obviously, when you look at it as a human, you just say, I'll put it there. But uh, for a machine to work that out is quite hard. So I was working on these two, three things, you know, Povre online rendering, Modu mock building, and um, the last bit that I've just forgotten. Um, the, the, you know, I was and I'm building these piles of Lego bricks, and um, I, I kind of thought, well, maybe I could get um, Modu to render my um, piles of bricks, and I knew I could script that, and then maybe I could put a sort of a website together that sort of would sort of illustrate this. So that's where Bricolo came from. It's really. Um, it's really about a computer building a pile of Lego bricks where every brick is connected by at least one stud. And the computer then frames the pile of bricks to make a nice picture of it. And um, although it seems kind of simple, it's, it's kind of complicated. And um, I haven't really seen um, many other 
online tools that are that are creating their own Lego models. There are there are a couple out there, but um, Bricolo was really about illustrating how you might get a computer to build Lego models uh, and create a nice picture of it. And uh, it was just a great way of sort of summarizing the work that I'd done um, on on these on these different elements. And uh, I'm I'm very fortunate that. Um, one of uh, one of the London Athols is is hosting Bricolo for me because um, it runs in the Amazon cloud. Um, so yeah, it was a great experience. I learned a lot, not just about digital Lego, but I learned a lot about building websites and um, you know running and monitoring websites. Um, so yeah, it was it was a good experience for me. Yeah, because you've at touched... www.bricolo.com. That's that's what I should say. Yeah, <laughs> just one more time. What was the website? www.bricolo.com yeah definitely for people out there go through and check it out uh it's really interesting stuff and like like what you say just trying to get things that we take for granted into a digital form i've um, also had a look to at the the l drawer and even just trying to figure out where studs are in a piece relative to one another it it, it sounds blatantly obvious but in in scripts and codes working that out is actually really difficult yeah absolutely and and um I, that's kind of i i love that aspect of it because people <laughs> people who don't play with lego look at it and say well it's just lego I and mean, obviously it sticks together um but digitally it doesn't stick together at all and um and, and lego Affles and, and Lego fans would look at a pile of Lego and tell you straight away if if there was an error in it. Um, and um, so, making sure that all your bricks fit together is is really quite a challenge. And another area that that I've never really looked at, but I think it's fascinating, is um, you know studs not on top, uh, snot bricks. <laughs> that 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 as in a digital Lego environment is massively complicated. And then mixing. Snot bricks and, and normal bricks is a huge uh, technical challenge. Um, but unless you're aware of it, it seems so simple. Well, obviously, you just put the plate on the side. Um, but but that, is, that is part of the fascination of digital Lego. Yeah, it's, it's funny because coming out of my dark age, I, I went into it and you basically, apart from headlight bricks, you didn't really have snot. So even, you know, coming back to Lego now and trying to understand snot in a way to build things is actually from a person, it's quite difficult. So, and, and as you said, the, the code implications of that is just uh, her, horrendously exponentially more difficult. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a fascinating challenge. I, I haven't, it's kind of on my list, but it's, it's, it appears so complex in my mind that um, I'm just, I'm just thinking about it a bit more. <laughs> yeah, fascinating challenge. Yeah, because you need to, to sort of have a real stew on that one to try yeah. to try <laughs> to figure out an approach. You need to mull that one over. A little bit, yeah. So just coming off that, what are some things that you're currently working on or you'd like to get to in the near future? Um, I think um, I two, uh, two things I'm, I'm kind of, moving up my priority list um one is a uh, is an extension of um my letter building code um which i think you and i have discussed in the past matt is is to create um sort of logos out of lego um non-square logos that are sort of self-supporting um with with colors um and and holes in them and in the in the presentation you saw you saw the uh, pumpkin face which uh which is a early test of that um uh with a with a and i i built it in such a way that it has a a sort of a large larger plates on the bottom and larger plate larger tiles on the top so that it will self-support when you when you put it all together i'm i'm kind of I'm in the process of trying to finish that, um, but there's a little bit more work to do. And the other one is um, really spending some more time in Unreal Engine. Um, I think the the opportunity to build uh, and, and interact with Lego in Unreal Engine is is quite fascinating because 
because of the the underlying physics engine you can you can start to create um visuals um animated visuals of of lego parts interacting with each other um that i i personally think it would be uh, it would be really interesting to explore so those are the two things that i'm sort of thinking about um on working on but um as i say i do much of my work on on my train journey to to and from work so i get an hour a day so it takes me a bit of time to to get things get things done but um you know i, I plod through it and uh, hopefully people find the results useful yeah yeah definitely there's a lot of useful stuff that you've written out there and it's just everybody will approach it in a different way and find uses for it um it might be putting you a bit on the spot and might come back to it if anybody is out there watching what would be the one thing or some things that you go it would be great for you if you could talk to somebody who knew something about x just to help with um, what you're doing or, or somebody to help what, what are some blind spots there um, well, I, I've always had a, um, a a personal fascination with um, kind of machine learning and um, getting a machine to really understand both the shape and orientation of studs um, w would be, I think, a, a, an amazingly interesting and challenging um task um because if if a if a machine could build lego with an understanding of the parts then you know i think it'd be interesting to see what it would build um uh, and and that i haven't seen anything really uh on, on the internet you know i've seen tools that that analyze shapes and and um, analyze real lego bricks and work out what they are and stuff but just giving uh you know a, a machine kind of thousands of digital lego bricks and saying put these together in a way that that works um i i think would be would be a huge challenge actually for for someone and then it feels like it's a sort of research project to, to see um how you might achieve this and, and but i'm i also feel certain that you know we might learn some interesting things about how machines understand construction and, and, um, and building and, and part fitting, uh, space filling. Um, you know, there's so many things that, that Lego touches on um, that have nothing to do with it being a toy. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's one area that I'd, I'd love to speak to to someone about um you know i've written a lot of code that sort of um puts lego bricks together but it's definitely not um machine learning or, or artificial intelligence it's just code churning through um different options um so yeah i suppose that's that's some something that i that i'd be happy to talk to people about Great. So if there's anybody out there watching this who knows a little bit about machine learning and wants to try to implement that with Lego Bricks, definitely get in touch with you. And what would be the best way for people to get in contact with you? Um, they probably just, if you do uh, info at bricolo.com, that will, that will find me. Um, and uh, yeah, please uh, drop me a note. And um, um, if there's, if there's opportunities to uh, explore um, how, how we might do that, it'd be, be uh, great to talk about it. Okay, brilliant. And one thing which you did, um, I think you uh, mentioned just in passing uh, before, but if you just uh, maybe comment on a little bit of auto framing of models. Um, so the, the challenge with framing uh, a Lego model is that obviously it's infinitely scalable to some extent. You can have a, a one by one tile or a, you know, 3000 part Lego model and um digitally obviously you can use the bounding box to um to calculate that framing um but you have to work out the the full dimensions of the model because it's built of thousands of little parts um so you have to construct a bounding box of the whole model um 
it's 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 not an impossible task but it's it's something that i always struggled with and um with Povray, there was a little tool that that would do that for you um and i haven't found an equivalent tool um that's scriptable in in stud io if you press render it will it will frame your your model um but um, what I was always seeking was a scriptable tool. So if you just basically gave it a an LDRAW file of any dimension, it would put the camera in the right position to uh, accurately show all your model. Um, and uh, I, I've always found that quite hard. But if again, if someone knows of a way of, of doing that in Blender, maybe they've got a Python script um, and, and they'd they'd be happy to share it then then that that would be uh, something that I would find quite useful um, so it's it's really auto framing and uh, it being scriptable as well so that you can really run your renders from the command line um, that would that that's that's what I've always found quite tricky uh, with Bricolo I I essentially I guess the fact that the pile of bricks will never be more than a certain height um, and it will always start at a certain point. So I'm pretty much guaranteed to always get all the bricks in the picture that I take. Um, but it is a guess. Um, and that was using Modu because I could not get the, the auto framing to work with Modu. I haven't really explored it in, ben, in Blender. There probably is an answer, but I just haven't found it yet. Yeah, I think um, both in Blender and LDCAD, the one thing which you do when building a model, you can select it and then uh, I think it's the C key or something, press center, and that will center uh, that that particular thing that you've selected within the viewport. Um, so there might be something uh, we can talk a bit more offline about that. Oh, uh, sure. I mean, centering is, is really useful. It's often It often ends up as viewport centering rather than camera centering, and um, that that's a... Uh, that's the you need camera centering um, to to take your nice picture, and I would expect there to kind of be a similar thing. It's just that I haven't obviously found it. Found um, it there, but but I'm sure. I hope someone will say, "Oh yeah, you just do this." <laughs> so that'd be good if, uh, yeah. if, if we get some feedback from this, and they say, "Yeah, you can just do this." Yeah, it's just one line of one line of code here. <laughs> yeah, great, <laughs> great, awesome, fantastic. <laughs> Um, just something which you were hinting at there, obviously doing work with kids and that, and I believe at one stage you're a teacher and you've done some work with Mon Mindstorms and Robot Wars. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on your experiences there? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I was a computer science teacher for a while and I uh, used quite a bit of Lego in my teaching. Um, it tended to be more kind of... Um, club based than um and kind of lessons as such um because i always felt that lego should be kind of fun um and uh, i was lucky enough i put in for a for a, a grant from um a pta who, who bought me some uh, mindstorm sets uh and um yeah we used to we used to have some uh some great some great club sessions where we would build you know simple robots and um, get them running around the floor. And, uh, you know, the great thing about Lego uh, within that sort of environment, it's pretty much indestructible and it tends to work. Um, you know, not, not always, but, but it kind of, it's kind of predictable to some extent. And that's really nice in a teaching environment, um, you know, when you kind of know what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was good fun. And then I sort of... Uh, started to think about doing uh lego robot wars sessions i mean they're not i don't really build robots they they use uh power functions motors and, and infrared um uh the infrared sensors um but uh i tend to do that for kind of uh, scout groups and stuff so uh you know 30 kids maybe and i have eight i have eight different colored robots and um you know they go through a through a, a sort of half hour of building their basic robot and uh then you know we get about 10 minutes of sticking various um uh you know technic sharp bits on well not sharp but um you know a barnacle 
swords and that sort of thing on them and and then we smash them up for you know 20 minutes which is great fun you know it's it's a it's a, it's a really it's really interesting to watch kids build um these kind of lego robots because because some build very defensive ones some build sort of robots with loads of weaponry sticking out of them that immediately falls off as soon as the the robot moves um you know some are quite fragile some are quite solid but we usually do two or three rounds and and, and what you can see is a kind of evolutionary design process so they very quickly work out what works and what doesn't awesome. um and what they if they put it on in a certain way it'll stay on better and if they put it on another way it won't stay on so well um and i find that really uh, interesting to watch as they work out how to add strength or uh, how to add shields to their to their models um and it, yeah, it's a sort of hour and a half um evening of of fun um you know and, and hopefully when when the lockdown has passed i'll i'll run some more um uh, but yeah, it's 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 good fun. That that one is uh, brick brickbattlingbots.com. I uh, know .co.uk brickbattlingbots all one word .co.uk. Um, yeah, it's it's a fun evening, um, and uh, yeah, I've, I'm kind of I kind of really enjoy it. The first time I did it, obviously it's complete mayhem, but um, <laughs> but these days, uh, you know, it it works very well. It's it's a it's a good evening session, and um, you know everyone. Scout leaders, teachers, uh, children all seem to get a lot out of it. And uh, yeah, really, I really enjoy that session. Yeah. And is that something you do as like a, a, a paid for workshop that uh, people can get in touch uh, with? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, if it's for scout groups and stuff, there's a, there's a small fee. Um, but, you know, I'm certainly not running it as a business. It's, it's, it's really a hobby that, uh, that I add my spare Lego parts to and, um, you know, I cover some of my petrol costs and, and a little bit of my time, but, uh, but yeah, it's not a, it's not a, it's certainly not a business and, and the costs aren't, aren't massive. They're, they're on the website. So, so okay. yeah, take a look. Take a look there. Yeah, definitely. So, um, and then just cause you obviously have the experience in uh, rendering out pictures and making them look really good. One thing which might be useful, can you just give a few high level tips on if you're using Blender, what are some good light setups or good ways or things to consider to get good images coming out of there? <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot, Matt. So um, <laughs> my, my experiences with Blender are, are um, fairly basic, uh, but I suppose um, the default when you if you there's a Lego plugin that you add an Eldraw plugin that you add to Blender, um, and um, that's quite simple to install. And you then go import and you choose your uh, LDR file and it, and it pops up in your in your window. Um, what I found the first thing I found is that there is an environment background um, that doesn't seem to work in this particular plugin. Um, and it turns your render pink um, and there, there's an option in your render settings to basically remove the background and if you remove this this environment background then um, everything looks normal so that's the first uh, thing to watch out for um, it's just to do with the when you import your um, Lego model it tries to create a sort of environment for you but it doesn't seem to work so everything goes pink um, from my experience that is normal uh, and if you remove the if you remove the environment background then everything renders fine that's the first thing to say because i spent about two weeks wondering what i was doing um the second thing is um the default lighting in blender creates uh quite hard shadows um so, you, so it looks nice but the shadows are really quite quite hard edged and um quite striking which is maybe what you want uh and i think it's an area light um i can't quite remember or if it's a sunlight but if you change the size of that light to about eight meters i think the default is about 0.1 meters then you get uh very similar lovely soft edge shadows that you see in studio um and um that 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 gives it a really nice, soft, a much more subtle lighting feel. 
Um, colored lights, um, obviously you can add lots of lights and change their colors. Um, in the little example that I had in the presentation, um, I think they were spotlights. What you need to remember when you're working in Blender with Digital Lego, I think it comes in um, the sort of original Lego size. So it's, it's really quite small. And that may not be quite what Blender's expecting. So you have to adjust the lights to really shine on quite a small area. Um, and that took me a bit of time to, to figure out. Um, I suppose the last thing to say is as you add more lights and more lighting complexity, the, the rendering time can increase dramatically. Um, you know, particularly if you're working at high resolution images, um, you can, you can go from, you know, four minutes to, to 15 minutes. If, if your, if your lighting setup is, is massively complex and, um, you know, for one frame, that's, that's not a big problem, but if you're then going to render an animation, suddenly you're rendering, um, for a lot longer than, than you might expect. Um, so th those are my those are my basic pointers for for getting some um, interesting lighting setups in in Blender. Yeah, no, that, that's great. There's one or two things there that you've mentioned, which I'm glad we're recording this because I can go back and have a look because I'm pretty sure I haven't been doing some of that stuff. And it, it is it is a real challenge, and I think it is one of those things where less is more. Like what you're saying, apart from the fact that you add in more lights your your render times blow out significantly it then becomes a matter of well then if you want to make subtle changes and you've got 10 lights and things it's like you don't know which one's controlling what and you know if you just got to oh, yeah definitely that is that is um that becomes as much a technical challenge in in managing your um what 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 you have now is a, is a 3d model setup you know you've kind of moved away from from uh digital Lego to some extent to working as a, as a technical, um, you know, technical project to manage all those lights and, and how they interact with each other. And uh, yeah, every time you press render, you're waiting 15 minutes to see exactly what that change was. See anything there. Yeah. And it is, you, you can get frustrated sort of like, okay, I've done all the work to get the, the model in place. It works. Da, 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 da. Now, why is it that person X next to me can get this wonderful looking image and I'm still can't even figure out why the thing's pink. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I, but it's important to say that, um, I definitely spent a number of weeks trying to fix the pink. Um, but you don't, you know, unless I say that you don't, you don't really realize that, that someone else has gone through that process. And, um, you know, the, the colored lights on the, on the pumpkin face in the, in the presentation took me a number of hours before I was kind of happy with them because, um, yeah, originally they were just kind of big blown out lights that, that didn't do what I wanted to do at all. Um, so yeah, don't feel you're alone when you're setting up those lights and, and it's not quite working. Um, everyone goes through that. And uh, certainly that is my experience. There is, there is, you have to put a bit of time in to, to figure out some of these things, but I'm happy to give people any clues to shorten that. Um, Cause yeah, you just, you just want to try and create those nice images as quickly as you can. Yeah, yeah, and, and as what you say, it becomes more of a technical exercise, which all of a sudden you're moving away from, well, wait a minute, I just wanted to build yeah. some Legos and have a nice output. All of a sudden I'm yeah. ripping my hair out with <laughs> a renderer, what? <laughs> yeah, um, but, uh, you know, there is value in, in being a, an expert Lego renderer for sure. If, if that's what you wanted to do and that's where you wanted to focus your time, um, you know, the people would... would would seek you out for your skills. Um, you know, they may, they may not pay you anything for it, but, um, you know, creating uh, beautiful Lego visuals, um, has, has a value to lots of people. So yeah, if you focused on a single area, um, then, then yeah, that, that's also really useful. That's a good one there too. Okay. Then. Great. Um, before we get into sort of, I guess what I call the rapid fire question round, is there anything else I should have asked you and haven't? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's been lovely to have an opportunity to talk about um, some, of, some of these things. I mean, sometimes I think when you, when you spend a lot of time in digital Lego, um, it, it, you feel a kind of a bit out on a limb because, you know, adults spending all their time playing with Lego is, is slightly out on a limb and, and then you're playing with virtual Lego all the time. 
um, is is weird. So it's lovely to have an opportunity to share just just some of my experiences, and um, hopefully some people will will be interested and and start to look at their own digital mocks. And as I say, some people may focus down on some very specific areas, um, but but there's definitely an interest in in some of those. Um, areas that I touched on in the presentation that haven't really been explored. I think, I think there is a, a great chance to, to kind of create some uh, fascinating images and examples. Yeah, yeah, I've been um, playing around with Blender now on and off for over 10 years and it feels like in the last six to 12 months, it's really starting to gain momentum and you've got some big game studios which have now basically given the Blender Foundation millions to go through and develop yeah. the product further and yeah, it seems like, you know, because I'm approaching it from a bit of a, a Blender artist point of view, if uh, if there's a, a an easy sort of link or step from 3D models to Blender to 3D printing, there's tremendous amount of potential and you better, you know, bring in lots of other people who've got those great skill sets in scripting and all all those. I think we've seen before there's one or two plugins out there at the moment for Blender, you know, they're paid ones, of course, which, you know, if people have invested the time and energy into it, um, then... But, uh, but I think that's a, that is a point that I don't think um, that we have touched on is that my own, you know, my own Python skills have... have you know blossomed hugely because i've spent hours playing with python and, and digital lego my understanding of python has has um just grown enormously i think because i definitely know a lot more than i did and um you know that that feeds into my work um you know i, I do you know some python scripting at work and and i find i can code some things much quicker than i could in the past um so you know, you, you can also gain uh, valuable transferable skills um, if, 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 you, if you're playing with, with digital Lego tools, whether you learn about Blender, whether you learn about Python, whether you just learn about transferring different model files between software, um, it, it all has a value that, that, you know, to some extent might help on a, on a CV. Uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult for people to look at digital lego and, and kind of appreciate the complexity of it but um but it still adds to your skill set and it certainly helped mine as, uh, as i've spent time playing with, with digital lego mm. yeah certainly i remember um there's a book written a couple of years ago brick by brick and they talk about in that in the the late 90s i think in terms of moving to digital uh, versions of lego and even with a company as well resourced with that, they completely struggled. And I think the project, amongst other things, it ended up failing, which is interesting mm. now to see um, where you've got the, the Eldraw pieces and how that is sort of becoming the, the sort of crux to it. I think part of the reason that the, the Lego one failed is because they were obsessed with making sure that Lego was written on every single stud, which, as you can imagine, in, in the late 90s, you can barely handle vertices, let alone, <laughs> you know, that level of complexity. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I think um, the, the skills you, you learn if you, if you spend time playing with digital Lego, they are transferable to other, to other tools. I, I really believe that. Yeah, definitely. And that's... Uh, I, I started learning Python to um, to do that as well because uh, Python is the the scripting language within Blender. So it's like, well, hit two birds with one stone here because I'm very much I know a little bit of scripting and enough to get by. And I've always been of this sort of thing. Well, if it's a monotonous task, how can I write a script so I never have to do it again? Yeah, yeah. I mean that that is um, that's kind of where I started. I think um, where I still um, kind of struggle sometimes is 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 then making a script that other people can use that that's also a real skill um it's very it's easier to write something that you can use personally to stop yourself having to do things hundreds of times uh and i think often people start scripting that way to then write something that that other people can use without them constantly emailing you saying this doesn't work or how do you do this <laughs> is is also a real skill um, that that has value way beyond Lego. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, it's much like the instructions. And once you start building them for Lego, 
as what you said, you know, you've got to then go back and actually build whatever it is you've done digitally with the instructions you've created. Cause all of a sudden you'll start finding, well, yes, that looks right there, but gravity is not in the instructions. Yeah. And as soon as you put that piece, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. work. I've definitely done that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Then we'll just finish up with the, uh, the rapid fire sort of round of things just sort of get a bit of a, an idea of Lego. Um, okay. and I know this one, might- might be a bit of a struggle because you do a lot of things digitally, but we'll see. Um, do you have a favorite set? Um, so I think the set that, um, that sort of drew me back into, into Lego to some extent was the Back to the Future ideas set. Um, you know, I don't know, just, it just sparked my interest and I always liked the film. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think I, I had to buy it second hand at the time because I'd missed, I'd missed it. But that sort of, I started to think at that point that I'm, I'm getting more interested in Lego than perhaps a normal person. Is. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was the back to the future one for me was, was, a was one I remember really well. Yep. Yep. Um, do you have a favorite Lego theme? Um, I think I like the ideas theme. I think I just like the randomness of it. You know, I like many of the themes. I don't like all of them. Um, but I like the fact that, that people, come up with new ideas um they're not all lego designers so it makes me feel like anything's possible in lego um and i've bought quite a few of them uh, built them and uh yeah i just love the sort of you never quite know what you're going to get i mean obviously you do but but within the whole theme you never quite know what's going to come through uh, so that that i think is a great idea yeah yeah excellent and is there a theme that you don't like never understood or glad that it's no longer in production um i have got a jack stone set and that is obviously <laughs> not well received by many people and, and that's probably <laughs> probably i mean you look at it and think uh, who, who came up with that um so sometimes th- there's a misstep i suppose it's entertaining to see to see that happen and and it's good when people learn from, from missteps. Um, so uh, you know, it's a classic, it's a classic unlike unloved, uh, theme, but, um, but it's certainly interesting to look at and, and try and work out why this really didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly the, uh, the brick by brick book goes into a lot of details and the context around that. And that was interesting. And certainly when I was in a dark age, you know, the, uh, walking into, uh, I think it was target that we had, you walk into target to go to the video games and you sort of walk past the toy section. And I remember seeing that on the shelf and it's sort of like, wow, I, I know I've been out of Lego for a while, but I have no idea what this is anymore. Like <laughs> I'm just getting old and don't understand it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a fascinating uh, a fascinating example of how things may not work. Work, yeah, yeah. Um, do you like Technic or not? I do quite like Technic. I mean, I I, I enjoy the the Technic stuff. Um, I, I'm not an engineer, so I don't I can't kind of figure out myself. But I, but I do like I like moving things. I like to create uh, something that that. Uh, it's called kinetic now but something that sort of moves i think is always adds an element of interest yeah if you can turn a handle or or, or you know turn a wheel and something else happens i, I like that yep um do you have any mock that you've done that you're proud of or you really enjoy doing um uh, I, one of the first ones i did was uh hastings pier i did a i did a mock of hastings pier uh, digitally and um and I and, and I put it on ideas and nothing happened. You know, I like got you know ten ten votes. And I thought, well, before I give up, I'll just send it to Hastings Pier. So I sent a picture to Hastings Pier and, and and back then it would tell you how many people viewed it. And and overnight it went from a uh, hundred people to seven thousand people. Uh, and I ended up on the radio at the end of the week speaking about it. <laughs> and of course, because it was digital, everyone wanted to see it. You know, could, could I bring it along? And I'm like, no, it's kind of not real, isn't it? It looks real. It looks real. Um, you know, so, uh, so that was good fun. You know, it was kind of, uh, it was a couple of crazy weeks. And um, yeah, it just showed how much interest there is when you create Lego models about things that people are... Uh, 
in you know interested in or, or have a relationship with um because yeah i got lots of messages of support and it was lovely so yeah hastings beer i really enjoyed building it okay brilliant oh something we might do afterwards um and then how big a space do you have for lego do you have a, a table a room a house <laughs> um I, I i have a lot of lego about my house but um you know obviously don't tell anyone but i don't build a lot of physical lego these days yeah um so my space my working space is really my laptop um you know so it's quite small um you know my my wife would definitely disagree and say i've got a lot of lego about the house but uh, i think in comparison to some some people's houses that i've seen i, I i'm not that bad um so yeah I, really most of my building is digital and um that kind of makes it easier to, to keep my lego under control yeah 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 it's sort of uh you can basically pull any piece that you ever need or, or can think yeah, of exactly without the expense <laughs> um so just from that did you just do a rough estimate on the number of lego pieces you have um well i'm gonna say i have an infinite number of lego pieces um because because i work digitally i have every color i have every brick um and if i don't have a brick there are tools that will allow me to build bricks um you know it is the joy of of digital lego it, it is an endless stream of, of lego bricks um if I wanted to make real Lego out of it, that would be, yes, financially challenging. But um, but yeah, I'm just going to say I have an infinite amount of digital Lego bricks. I have a lot of real Lego too, but uh, but I've never really counted. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I, I think you'll uh, in the, the interviews to come, you'll you'll be the uh, the number one with the the infinite number of Lego bricks. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to That's retire. Good. Might have to retire that question now. <laughs> There's nowhere to go from there. Um, is there any uh, theme you wish they'd do or bring back? Um, so, the one thing I miss um, is I used to have the Lego Harry Potter game on my iPhone, and I was up to about I don't know ninety two percent. And I upgraded my iOS, you know, whenever, one day, and, yeah. and, and the game didn't come back. Oh. And I thought, oh, what's, what's happening there? And then, then it, they, I'd realised they'd sort of pulled it. So I never managed to finish it. So I have this kind of desperate urge to finish Lego Harry Potter um, to get to 100%. Uh, but, but it's not available on the App Store anymore, and, and I don't think it'll ever come back. But, uh, but yeah, I, I miss that. You'll have to get a, a, a PlayStation or something because... Yeah, I maybe. It's maybe yeah. It's just, again, I always played it on the train, you know, um, when I wasn't building digital Lego, Lego. I would take a break by <laughs> playing Lego Harry Potter. Um, but yeah, then suddenly I couldn't play it anymore. So yes, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I could do it on a, on a PlayStation, but, uh, but I'd like to see it back on my iPhone. iPhone there. Yeah, it's handy for the commute then. <laughs> yeah. Um, and do you have a favourite Lego build of the last year? Um, again, I'm going to choose an ideas set, I think, and I like the Tron set. Um, I think it was Tron Legacy, wasn't it? I can't remember. But was that last year? It's certainly recent. Yeah, and, there's... Um, I always love the film, and uh, I think I think the design of that was was nice. It was a, it was a nice homage to the film. It felt very like the film, um, and just in such a little set, it really encapsulated what the film was about. And I think that's, that's you know, really clever of, of the, the guy who designed it to, to kind of capture that little moment so vividly. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed the transfer. Yeah, yeah. The um, just as a side note, the the original light cycle design was done by a guy called Sid Mead, and as an artist, he, he was phenomenal because um, he also did the initial. Uh, he was the same guy who did a lot of the concept work for Blade Runner and the early Aliens okay. film and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, unfortunately, a couple of months ago, he just passed away because um, he's. Ah, that's a shame. I missed that. I know I didn't know that at all, but. Um... That kind of explains a lot, yeah, because they it was a it was a great design. 
yeah, yeah. And because he originally uh, was, it's digressing, but he trained to be a car designer and he worked for Ford in the, I think it was the early 60s. Okay. Uh, and I think he designed one of the, I'm not a car person, so, but he designed one of the now famous headlight types or fin types or something like that. Like it was just, his impact was so huge and any, any conceptual designer or any artist generally knows about the guy. Uh, well, no, that's, that's uh, something I've learned today and I, and I may go and check him out because yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting fact. And yeah, that, that it was a great design and I love Blade Runner. That was a, that was a, another beautifully uh, designed film, um, but no, I wasn't aware of that. So, so yeah, thanks for that. I will, yeah. I will Cause if you watch Blade Runner, he has the fourth credit. And at that stage, they didn't know what a conceptual design, like nobody, like they basically went to him and said, well, how do you want to be credited? Because, you know, the, the, at that stage, there was no concept designer or, you know, art director type role yeah. as such. And he said, oh, just call me a visual futurist. And that's, I like it. That's what it is. <laughs> if you, next time you see uh, the, the film, look, uh, fourth credit, you'll see. I'm, I'm going to. I've, I've got it. I've got it on DVD. I'm going to go and look. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, and this, do you have a favorite Lego resource or website or book or podcast or news site? Um, I, su- I mean, I, I suppose um, I use uh, Eurobricks. I like Eurobricks. Uh, there's, a, there's a little kind of digital Lego channel on there. Um, and there are some very uh, clever guys uh, on there. And, and that, when you post stuff on there, um, you know, you get you get good feedback and and some good ideas, and uh, I value the the people looking looking on the site. They 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 know their stuff, um. So I so I enjoy um, so I enjoy dipping in and out of Eurobricks, um, you know, sharing some of my um, some of my designs and, and models on there, and uh, yeah, I, I get uh, I get good feedback from those guys. So yeah, that's a good resource for me. Yeah, Eurobricks is great. There's a page there in particular I've got bookmarked which translates the colour names between Bricklink and Lego. Yeah, yeah, and, and little things like that, just, just really useful. And again, you know, someone spent a lot of time kind of putting that all together. Um, and uh, yeah, Unsung Hero, because loads of people find that a really useful little tool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and any set that you wish you bought but you never did? Uh, so I wish I'd bought all the Series 1 minifigures. Um, I think, I think you know, at the time, because it was kind of new and, and I don't know, I wasn't, I was into Lego, but I wasn't really thinking about it. But, you know, I've always liked minifigures. But now looking back on it, I wish I'd bought the Series 1 minifigures. Yeah. So... I did buy the Series 1 Disney, I bought all of them, and then I bought all of the Harry Potter Series 1. Um, yeah, because I just love the characterization. Um, I, you know, again, it's just really nicely done. Um, and at the time, obviously, it was it was very new, you know, there, obviously there were minifigures around, but just to have this sort of range of, of different characters captured uh, you know, in a in a little minifigure was was a great idea. So yeah, I, I kind of regret not not engaging with those more at the time. And I've definitely spent too many hours standing in the Lego store filling packets. For, <laughs> um, but hey, it's, 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 that's part of being an Apple. That's yeah. Which leads on nicely to the next one. Any Apple groups that you're part of? So we've already talked about London Apples, which is uh, the, the one I, the, that I mostly the, spend most of my time with and um, in, enjoy the meetups with the, with the guys enormously. Um, some, some great challenge evenings and, and build nights. And as you said, we had a, a virtual masterclass um, the other day. You know, very, very um, dynamic and in, engaging crowd. Very, very knowledgeable people happy to share their knowledge, um, happy to share their experiences. So, so it's a good, it's a good crew. And, uh, and I'm also a member of Brickish. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's obviously a much broader base. Um, and, um, I don't have as much interaction with them, but, um, but it just feels, 
um because it's a it's a very small subscription really like um it's it's a good thing to be part of as a, as a national organization um so those two are the, the two groups i'm really really um, involved with yep and just to round it out i know we had it peppered throughout the interview uh best way for people to get in contact with you uh so yeah i mean i run um a few websites i run uh, obviously uh bricolo bricolo.com um I have another one called uh, brickbattlingbots.co.uk, which is really just um, those Lego Robot Wars things. I have a blog, uh, which I think should be uh, cultofthebrick.com, um, where I just, you know, ramble about my experiences in digital Lego. Um, but I try and put something up uh, on a monthly basis, um, just just my experiences and. Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you uh, click on any one of those and, and do send an email or, or click the uh, the info at link, then uh, then your message will find me. Happy to happy to talk to you about uh, my digital Lego experiences. Oh, brilliant, excellent! And just before we finish off, is there just one last time anything else I should have asked you about, or anything else you want to make comments on? Oh. Um, Gosh, no! I think I've I think I've talked for more than long enough, Matt. Um, <laughs> it's been uh, it's been a fascinating and enjoyable experience, and, and thanks for asking me. Um, I hope uh, I hope other people find it useful, and um, yeah, I hope to uh, have some more um, code and images that I can share with people in the near future. Brilliant, excellent. No, it's just I mean, as I said, that initial. Uh, presentation you did on digital brick building it was great primer a way for people to really understand it and get in and just thought um you know we can't just have that exist as a, a sole thing on last monday night it's like you know if we can capture that and get it out to more people because there there's not much video on some of the digital aspects or it, it is really hard to find things uh no i, I agree I, I think it's um it's a slightly underdeveloped area but but it's um but it can be really interesting and there's, there's lots of things to explore. Um, if, uh, if you, if you want to, if you want to spend time in digital Lego, there is, there is lots of things to look at. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. Well, no, I've really enjoyed this and I love just having a chat with people cause you just get everybody's coming out from a different way and different experiences and things that you didn't know. So you always learn so much, which is brilliant. So thanks you very much. Hi, you're welcome, Matt. Thank you. And, um, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll speak again soon at uh, London Athens. Yep, brilliant. So if you'd like to be on the show, feel free to get in contact with me at matt at mattelder.com. That's it from us here at Family Bricks. Until next time when we talk about all things Lego. This is a Family Bricks video. Be sure to hit that like button, share, and if you want to be super awesome, subscribe. Click the bell and select all to be notified of new videos as they're uploaded. Here are some other videos you might be interested in.